Good morning, church. And happy Sabbath once again. <clears throat> Last week, we looked at we looked at how God uses prophets. And we looked at how God rose up a prophet with a message and then rose up another prophet that went along tied with that same message. And how and how at the end of time God would raise up prophets. And in a specific way, God raised up a prophet to continue the message of Daniel 8.14. Which, after studying Daniel 8.14, we know that it is fulfilled in 18.44, and God rose up a messenger of the Lord, a prophet, a prophetess. And I know that in the Seventh-day Adventist Church, this is one of our 28 fundamental beliefs. Not because we just feel like putting anything in our 28 fundamental beliefs, but because it's scriptural. And we're going to, we're going to spend time this month on looking what the Bible says of prophets, of pro in a special way, um, the prophetess Ellen G. White. Unfortunately, there, are, there is among the Seventh-day Adventist Church those who, who don't find her youthful or inspiring. And I would like to invite you, if you are that person, to take the prayer request card and write whatever question, concern, or doubt that you may have regarding Ellen G. White. And at the end of the service, there will be a deacon with a tray and just put in your question, you don't put your name, just put in your question, and we will spend time reviewing and giving an answer to any doubts regarding the ministry of Ellen G. White. Just like any doctrine should be tested by scripture, so also the ministry of Ellen G. White. And so also her ministry has passed all tests. So this morning we're going to continue looking at, at the ministry of Ellen G. White, but more looking as her as a mother, as a wife, and as a prophetess. And as our scripture was read, I invite you to turn to Matthew chapter 7. Matthew chapter 7, verses 15. It says, Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are, rage, they are ravenous wolves. You will know them by their fruits. Do men gather grapes from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? The answer is no. Even so, every good tree bears good fruit, but a bad tree bears bad fruit. A good tree cannot bear bad fruit, nor can a bad tree bear good fruits. And that's very important. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Therefore, by their fruits you will know them. You want to know about somebody, just look at their fruits. Just look at the fruits. And we're going to look at the fruits of Ellen White uh, this, this morning. So let's, let's begin with a word of prayer. Father in heaven, as we open your word and open the writings of Ellen White, I ask that your spirit may abide here in our hearts as we study this subject. Please put away and help us to put away any distractions that may take away our focus of today's message. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Well, Ellen G. White was born in November 26, 1827. Her parents are, Harman, uh, are Robert and Eunice Harmon. 
And she, before she was born, she had two brothers and four sisters. So there were already a family of six children. And when they realized that another baby was coming, thinking it would be seven, to their surprise, twins came. And Ellen and Elizabeth were born. And so now, Robert Harmon had a big family to feed. And so, so he, he worked. But uh, at the age of nine, Ellen White suffered a terrible, terrible accident from, I would say, a jealous friend or companion who, while walking out through a rock, and hit her right in the face. And this, this accident, uh, she, she describes it in, in live sketches on, in page 17. And she says, I was stunned by the blow and fell senseless to the ground. When, when consciousness returned, I found myself in a merchant store. A kind stranger offered to take me home in his carriage, but I, not recognizing my weakness, told him that I preferred to walk. Now eventually she couldn't walk and her sister and other friends carried her to her home. She also describes about it in Spiritual Gifts, Volume 2, page 10. This, this hit, this blow to the face, really disfigured her face very much. That, that doctors even suggested of putting a wire in her nose to hold it. And so she continues describing it here. It says, at the time of my misfortune, my father was absent in Georgia. He was working and he finally comes home. When he returned, he spoke to my brothers and sisters and inquired for me. I was pointed out by my mother, but my father did not know me. It was hard to make him believe that I was his Ellen. This cut me to the heart. Yet I tried to put on a, an, an appearance of cheerfulness when my heart ached. And so this, this accident that, that affected her for the rest of her life was not just a misfortune, but even, even when she got better and she, re, and she tried to return to school, it was hard for her to concentrate. Uh, she would feel dizzy. She couldn't remember very much things. It affected her mind. It affected her way of thinking and her concentration. And would you believe it that the girl who threw the rock was appointed to be her mentor while she was trying to recover and learn again? And she writes about this in, in, in Life Sketches. Life Sketches is one of my favorite books because personal stories are in that book. And, and, and she describes on how, how she, she forgave this other girl who, who had done this to her. Now the accident had affected her life, her education, but yet it was a means for her to find Jesus. How, how interesting. And she, she tells us this in Life Sketches, page 39. Faith now took possession of my heart because she felt that her life was going anywhere she wanted to die, but she turned to Jesus. She turned, she, she turned to the Bible. And at that time, her family were Methodist and, and her pastor came and visited her and encouraged her. And she here writes about it and says, Faith now took possession of my heart. I felt an inexpressible love for God and had witness of His Spirit that my sins were pardoned. My views of the Father were changed. I now looked upon Him as a kind and tender parent rather than a stern tyrant compelling men to a blind obedience. My heart went out toward Him in a deep and fervent love. And she continues on saying, I could even praise God for the misfortune that had been the trial of my life. 
praise God, for it had been the means of fixing my thoughts upon eternity. Naturally proud and ambitious, I might not have been inclined to give my heart to Jesus had it not been for the sore affliction that had cut me off. Wow, what a testimony. What a testimony. And, and during, these, during these years, a prominent preacher around 1840, known, uh, known as William Miller, was preaching and reviving uh, Christianity at this time. And at the age of 13, she gave her heart to God. She gave her heart to God. And she praised God for the accident in thinking that it was, it might have been the only way where she had focused on Jesus. Well, in December of 1844, she was among the Advent group that were waiting for Jesus to return. And when Jesus didn't return on October 22nd, 1844, she did get discouraged, but she never lost her faith and hope and she continued in studying the Bible. And in, the, in December of that year, G God gave Ellen her first vision. And here she describes it, continuing from Life Sketches. She says, while we were praying, the power of God came upon me as I had never felt it before. I seemed to be surrounded with a light and to be rising higher and higher from the earth. I turned to look for the Advent people in the world but could not find them when a voice said to me, look again and look a little higher. And, at, and this I raised my eyes and saw a straight and narrow path cast up high above the world. On this path the Advent people were traveling to the city which was at the farther end of the path. This light shone all along the path and gave light to their feet so that they might not stumble. And notice this, this, this next sentence. If they, if they kept their eyes fixed on Jesus, he who, he who was just before them, leading them to the city, they were safe. They were safe. And with this in mind, keeping your eyes on Jesus, this became her focal point in her 70 years of ministry. Amen. Keeping your eyes on Jesus. Amen. Keeping your eyes on Jesus. So what kind of a woman was Ellen G. White? Well, she was a wife, a mother, a homemaker, a visionary, a church leader, a public speaker, an author. She is recorded to be a short woman, 5'2" with brown eyes, her hair parted and combed back in a bun, and she was known for wearing a black velvet two-piece garment with white cuffs and collar and with a gold watch chain. And here is an is a actual picture of her, and she was dressed as a Victorian woman because she was a Victorian woman. This was a common dress for a Victorian woman. And she married a preacher by the names of James White. Her maiden name uh, was Harmon, Ellen Gould Harmon. And she married a preacher by the name of James White at the age of 19 and James being 25. And both began the work of the ministry. Both continued the work of the ministry. And we get a glimpse, we get a glimpse of who she, she was by her by the, the testimony of other people and by her own writings as well. And we're going to look at some of that today. There, there was a wedding that James White performed and at this wedding, Ellen and James were, were, were passing through and they were invited by this newlywed couple to stay at their house since, since, since James and Ellen still had a journey to go. The couple said, you know, for tonight, just stay at our house and don't travel all night long. They felt a little bit uncomfortable knowing that it was their wedding night. James had just married them that day. But they accepted the invitation. And so, so they had their own quarters and the newlywed had their, 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 their bedroom. And uh, Ellen White noticed this newlywed 
um, couple, especially the husband, pacing the hall. Just pacing the hall. And so, and so it's recorded uh, from Messenger of the Lord. It's a, if you want to know many letters that she wrote, read this book. It recorded her giving this young man counsel. And she says, Daniel is, is the man that, that got married. Inside that room is a frightened young woman in bed, petrified with fear. Now you go into her right now, and you love her, and you comfort her. And Daniel, you treat her gentle, and you treat her tenderly, and you treat her lovingly. It will do her good. And Daniel, it will do you good too. <laughs> we, see, we, see, we see a little, a, a, a little bit of, of how Ellen White was. A balanced, loving, caring woman. She even wrote to her, to her husband, James, when he would travel and go out of town working. Here is a letter where she says, We are all well as usual. It takes a little time to get settled down from the excitement of your going. You may be assured we miss you, especially do we feel the loss of your society when, when we gather about the fireplace evening. We feel your absence when we sit down around the social board or the dining table, but we shall be more used to this after a while. And she sent other, other letters to him while he was absent, and here we see a, a wife that, that writes to her husband letting him know that, that she cares. Here we, we have another, another letter and we see a little bit of humor from sis, sis, Sister White where she says, I had written you quite a lengthy letter last night but the ink was spilled upon it making an unsight, unsight, unsightly blotch and I will not send it. We received your few words last night on the postcards and this was a postcard that James sent to her and she's quoting him. Battle Creek, April 11th, no letter from you for two days, James White. <laughs> <laughs> and then notice her response, okay? What is she response? This lengthy letter <laughs> was written by yourself. Thank you for we know you are living. <laughs> and then she continues saying, I will write every morning, will you do the same? Do we see that? that loving of a relationship from a wife to a husband and the husband to the wife, of a, of a loving wife that, that she was. And many times when James was ill, she stood by his side, even though she had much work to do. Here, again, for Messenger of the Lord, page 55, she's writing to her children, says, Dear children, I am tired tonight. I have been trying to get a piece for the health reformer. That was a periodical. It is hard to write much, for Father is so lonesome I have to, to ride out with him and devote considerable time to keep him company. Father is quite cheerful, but talks but little. We have some very precious seasons of prayers, and we believe that God will raise him to health. In another letter she writes also, I am his constant companion in writing and by the fireplace. Should I go shut myself in a room and leave him sitting alone, he would become nervous and restless. He depends on me and I shall not leave him in his feebleness. You see here, a loving wife taking care of a sick husband. Take, even though she has much work to do, taking care of her husband. Now, as a mother, Ellen and James had four children. Henry, James, Edson, William, and John Herbert. All boys. No girls. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> but she knew what it's like to, to, to raise a family and to lose someone in the family. To lose someone in the family. James Edson is, is, became a preacher and is known to taking the Advent message to the African-American people. 
And this was, you have to re remember during this time, late 1800s, early 1900s, when it was not popular to accept those, to accept African Americans as normal people. And yet, they, she worked with her son, and her son was one of the pioneers that raised churches in the African American group. Amen. And, and speaking also of William, who also became a preacher. Now John Herbert, their youngest, their youngest son, died at three months. And this was very hard for her, and, and, she, and she writes about it here in Spiritual Gifts, Volume 2. She says, My dear babe was a great sufferer, 24 hours and nights, no, tw 24 days and nights, we anxiously watched over him using all the remedies we could for his recovery and earnestly presenting his case to the Lord. At times, I could not control my feelings as I witnessed his suffering. Much of my time was spent in tears and humble supplication to God. But our Heavenly Father saw fit to remove my, my lovely babe. She knew what it's like to lose a son. To lose a son. And she continues describing, I listened to his laboring breathing and felt his pultless wrist. I knew that he must die. That was an hour of anguish for me. The icy hand of death was already upon him. We watched his feeble grasping breath until it ceased and we felt thankful that his suffering were ended. And it continues, especially here, I fainted at the funeral. We're getting a glimpse of, of, of how uh, the type of woman that Ellen White was. Sometimes we just picture her as a person who is always writing or always telling people. But here we see her as a suffering mother when her three months old son died. My heart ached as though it would break, yet I could not shed a tear. And we were disappointed in not having Brother Longbro to conduct the funeral service, and my husband spoke at the occasion to the crowded house. The father had to preach his own funeral for his own son. So here we see a glimpse of, of, of Ellen White as a mother, and only three years after, after John Herbert passed away, Henry, her first son, dies at the age of 16 from pneumonia. At the age of 16, her first son, three years after this death in the family, there is another. There is another. And, and, and when you read, uh, I didn't quote all of the quotes here, but there are many others. And there's a request that, that Henry, as he's dying, he says, when I die, bury me next to my brother. So we will raise together when Jesus comes. And, and, and he had given his heart to the Lord. So it doesn't matter what your calling is. If you are a mother who has lost one or two, you are cut to the heart and your heart is broken. Whether you're a prophetess or not, it doesn't matter what your calling is. When somebody dies, it cuts you to the heart. And here we see Ellen White's reactions and emotions as just an, a, a regular mother. A regular mother. <clears throat> now, what I appreciate about Ellen G. White was that she was also a balanced woman. She was also a balanced woman. She didn't go to one extreme of fanaticism but well, she didn't go to the other extreme of, of uh, liberalism. She encouraged her husband to take vacations. And, and she would counsel him many times, you are working too hard. You're going to burn yourself out. You're going to burn out. And here she writes, she, we, we found a letter where she wrote, where she wrote to, to James. 
And she says, Father, our writings can be done in the winter. Because remember, they, they, they were writing all the time. And James White was one of our early first Sabbath school editors and writers. And so here she says, our writings can be done in the winter. Lay it aside now. Throw off every burden and be a carefree boy again. At this time, you know, uh, James and his son and his daughter-in-law went out to the mountains for a little time off. Will and Mary, Mary is the wife of Will, they, if they stay in the mountains a few weeks longer, should neither study nor write. I like that. They should be made happy for this season, that they may be able to look back to this time as a season of unalloyed or pure pleasure. And she continues saying, The few days you now have together improve, roam about, camp out, fish, hunt, go to places that you have not seen, rest as you go, and enjoy everything. Then come back to your work fresh and vigorous. So we see here a balance that, that, that she also encouraged, besides the work that they had to do, a balance of, of relaxing. And so, now looking at, at uh, Ellen G. White as a prophet, as a prophetess, there are biblical tests for a prophet. And the first one that we're going to see is Isaiah 8.20. Here, these are, these are tests that we should give to any person who claims to be a prophet. And Isaiah 8.20, some of us know this verse by heart, where it says, If they do not speak according to the law and the prophets, there is no light in them. Isaiah 8 verse 20 says, To the law and to the testimony, if they do not speak according to this word, it is because there is no light in them. Any person who claims to be a messenger of the Lord, having visions from the Lord, has to consist with what the Bible says. They have to be biblically faithful. Amen. They cannot go contrary to what the Bible says. Another, another test is in Deuteronomy 13, 1 through 3, they have to be commandment keepers. And it just makes sense. If, they're, if they believe what the Bible says, then they believe that God expects us to keep the Ten Commandments. And in Deuteronomy 13, 1 through 3, here the Bible says, If there arise among you a prophet or a dreamer of dreams, and he gives you a sign or a wonder, and the, and the sign or the wonder comes to pass, of which he spoke to you, saying, Let us go after other gods which you have not known, and let us serve them. And the Bible tells us easily, clearly, the Bible tells us, Thou shalt not have any other gods. But here, if a prophet says, Hey, let's go up to other gods. Verse 3 says, You shall not listen to the words of that prophet or that dreamer of dreams. For the Lord your God is testing you to know whether you love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul. They must be commandment keepers. Keep God's commandments. They must be Christ-centered. 1 John 4, 1 and 2. 1 John chapter 4, verse 1 and 2. Every prophet that we have, that, that you will find in the Bible, points people to God. Every single one. Noah, repent. That's turning you back to God. Moses, Jeremiah, John the Baptist, behold the Son of God. Every prophet that God raised pointed people to the Messiah. And so if somebody were to raise up today to be a prophet, I would expect them to point us to Jesus. And here in 1 John 4, 1 and 2, it says, Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirit, whether they are of God. Because many false prophets have gone out into the world. By this you know the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is of God. 
they must be Christ-centered. They must be Christ-centered. And everything that, that you read, especially the classic book, Step to Christ, points you straight to Jesus. According with Desire of Ages, Patriarchs and Prophets, every single uh, book that Sister White has written. Another biblical test is prophetic accuracy in Jeremiah 28 verse 9. Jeremiah 28, whatever they say is going to happen, if they say a prophecy, is, it has to come to pass. Not just 9 out of 10, but 10 out of 10. If they are a messenger of the Lord, God doesn't make a mistake. And here in Jeremiah 28, verse 9. As for the prophet who prophesies of peace, when the word of the prophets come to pass, the prophet will be known as one whom the Lord has truly sent. It has to pass. Now, there are condition prophecies. I'm not talking about condition prophecies, but just regular prophecies. And there are several things that Ellen White prophesied. Ellen White predicted that the Review and Herald and the Sanitarium would be burnt down if they did not change their ways. The Review and Herald was one of our early publishing houses where they would publish our material. But yet they began to publish other things that were not Christians, other uh, documents and periodicals. And God was not pleased with that. And God told Sister White, you need to warn them that they need to change. Otherwise, my judgment will come on the publishing house. The same thing happened with the sanitarium. Dr. Kellogg started, his ego started to grow. And he wanted the sanitarium to be bigger and better. And God said, no, no, it's not about you. And it, it shouldn't be as big as you want it. We need l several sanitariums in several places, not one big mega one. And he, and he gave the same warning. And so she predicted that they would burn if they did not change. And in publishing ministry, it came to pass. It came to pass. Here she receives a letter. And I'm sorry, she writes a letter. And she says, Today I received a letter from Elder Daniels, who was the General Conference President, regarding the destruction of the review office by fire. I feel very sad as I consider the great loss to the cause. I know that this must be a very trying time for the brethren in charge of the work and for the employees of the office. I am, aff I am aff afflicted with all who are afflicted. Now, nobody was killed in the burning, but yet it was destroyed. And she continues saying, But I was not surprised by the sad news. For in the visions of the night, I, s I have seen an angel standing with a sword as of fire stretching over Battle Creek. It, se it seemed as if this sword of flame were turning first in one direction and then in another. Disaster seemed to follow disaster because God was dishonored by the div devising of men to exalt and glorify themselves. So here we see a prediction that she made and it came to pass. Now this prediction was conditional because if they would have changed, they would not have been destroyed. Just like Nineveh with a conditioned prof uh, 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 prophecy. Ellen White also predicted that Protestants and Rome would unite in the last days. We can see this in Great Controversy, page 288. The Protestants of the United States will be foremost to stretch their hands across the gulf to grasp the hand of spiritualism. They will reach out over the abyss to clasp hands with the Roman power. And if you've been keeping up with Tony Palmer and other Protestant news, mostly all Protestant non-evangelicals are reaching out to Rome to let's be friends and let's forget our doctrinal differences. That's happening right now. It's already happened. <laughs> And churches and churches and denominations are joining. Let's all be one happy family. And yet she predicted that this would happen. Now keep in mind when she predicted this, 
the United States wanted nothing to do with the papacy. Let's keep in mind and remember that, we, that the United States grew of people fleeing from Rome, fleeing from the papacy, fleeing from, from a kingdom and a papacy system. That's why, that's why when, when you read history, people, people were a little bit afraid, even though they loved John F. Kennedy as the president, they were a little bit fearful because he was Catholic. And they were, well, sh can we really trust him? He's going to need the nation. But now we see a different view of joining with, with, with um, our, our Catholic friends and uniting with them. And yet she predicted that when, when people thought we, have not, we want nothing to do with Rome anymore. And yet now, evangelicals and Protestants want a lot to do with them. Ellen White predicted the harm of tobacco to the body. This was during the time when tobacco was, was given as medicine. In Councils on Health, page 84, she says, Tobacco is a poison of the most deceitful and malignant kind, having an exciting, then a paralyzing influence upon the nerves of the body. Notice how detailed she goes about the nerves. She didn't study medicine. How did she know this? God speaks to the prophets. <laughs> upon the nerves of the body, it is all the most dangerous because its effects upon the systems are so slow. Multitudes have fallen victims of its poisonous influence. And she wrote this in 1864. 1864. Not until 1957 did a committee of scientists appointed by the American Cancer Society and the American Heart Association conclude that smoking was a causative factor in lung cancer. 93 years later, science catches up. But yet God speaks to his prophets. God speaks to his prophets. In Numbers, another, another biblical test is Numbers 12 verse 6 is that they would have visions and dreams. Numbers chapter 12, verse 6. It says, Then he said, Hear now my words. If there is a prophet among you, I the Lord make myself known to him in a vision. I speak to him in a dream. That's how God communicates with his prophets, through visions and dreams. And that, that, that's how he communicated even to the prophets in scripture. One that comes to my mind just right off the top of the bat is Daniel. When God gave him the, the interpretation of Daniel 2, he gave it to him in a dream. Daniel 7 as well. So if we go back to our scriptural verse in Matthew chapter 7 we are told that by their fruits we will know them by their fruits we will know them and I want to encourage you friends to read Ellen White for yourself Amen. by their fruits you will know them not by the internet anyone can Anyone can write anything on, a, on the internet. Not by the opinions of somebody else, but by their own fruits, their own testimony, their own words, and their own works. And today I would like to invite you to get to know for yourself Ellen G. White by her own writings. Last week I gave, for those who didn't have, a copy of The Great Controversy. And today, again, I'm going to give, if I can have some deacons help me, a copy, but not of the great controversy, but a book, if you can pass these out for those who do not have one, a book that you will perish, I'm sorry, that you will cherish <laughs> for the rest of your life. If you do not have Steps to Christ, if you have never read this book or heard about this book, just raise your hand high to the ground, high to the air. <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm being backwards today. 
Raise your hand high if there's some in the balcony as well. This book will lead you closer to Jesus Christ. And it passes all of the tests. It is biblically, it is, it is biblical. The references that she makes here to the Bible are accurate. She is a commandment keeper. She is Christ-centered. She leads people to Jesus Christ. She doesn't lead people to herself. On the contrary, she is recorded that she, she is recorded saying, if people would have studied the Bible, God would not have needed to raise me. She leads people to Christ. Her prophecies have come true and God has spoken to her in visions and dreams. And I would just encourage if you are ever really down in your spiritual life, you don't feel like even reading the Bible, just read Steps to Christ. And it will turn you back to reading the Bible. I guarantee it. There is another hand over there in the back. There is another hand over there in the back. And there's another. If you, if you still have not received one and would like one, just keep raising your hand and our deacons will, will have one given to you. When I first read The Great Controversy, halfway in the book, there's one more hand right there. Yeah, right there. Halfway in the book, the first thing I did was buy this Bible. <laughs> so I am, I can give a testimony that she does lead people back to the Bible, back to the Word of God. And this book here, Steps to Christ, in two weeks I will read a quote for you that, that I even have written down in my own Bible that it is the most powerful quote for me in this book. But I encourage you to, to read and get to know Ellen G. White. Amen. Taste for yourself and see if, see if the fruit is sweet. And friends, it is sweet. It is sweet. Again, I just want to encourage you, if you have any questions regarding or doubt her, write your question on these cards and give it to the deacon at the end and we will address it. We will address it. And, and answer, and answer uh, that doubt or, or questions as well. So friends, may God bless you. May we take everything to the Word of God.